things we want to talk about today is a conversation. It's more of a set of stories and some very simple slides where we talk about some of the things we're facing in the industry. You've heard a lot of it over the last day. The fundamentals, what's happening industry-wide, what's happening at the macro scale, the current landscape about IT and about technology in general, and why things are driven at a faster and faster pace, and then some approaches and some obstacles. You might, you, you know, might use the approaches and experience the obstacles in trying to leverage technology in new ways to achieve competitive advantage. And then we'll talk about the end goal. So Miyamoto Musashi, who was one of the greatest swordsmen who ever lived, said something very interesting in the Book of Five Rings. One of the things he said is, you must know the smallest and the largest. You must understand the most minute and the most profound. And this is one of those things where I want us to take a step back. If you look, we talk about Moore's Law, and we will in a minute, and we talk about technology curves, and we talk about exponential growth. We never really talk about what's driving that, right? Why? Is it a miracle that processors increase exponentially in their power? And the reality is that the factor driving that is the marketplace. So if you look historically since 1820, GDP per capita, what has the world economy done? Well, you see the curve here. It's not a linear curve, is it? It's an exponential curve. Competitively, particularly since really the mid-40s, the marketplace has accelerated at an exponential rate. And these are normalized dollars, so they, they, they're, they're a factor we can talk about. Any, any slide here we can probably spend a half day on uh, going through the data and the analytics behind it. But if you think about that, this is the big picture. This is what drives technology. Everybody trying to get their piece of that curve. It's global finance, it's a global competitive marketplace. If you are not growing at that pace, you are losing ground. So for IT, this is it, right? This is the slide that Moore is famous for. Oh wait, let's apply Moore's law to it. Exponential growth in computing capabilities, right? You use a logarithm, you apply it to the data, and this is something interesting. You'll see, you know, you'll, you'll see a lot of people use Kurzweil slides. I actually use raw data because Kurzweil does some pruning and uses Intel-only data. We won't you know, question that. But uh, the reality is across processor models, across the industry, this has been proven true time and time again. What does that mean? What does that mean to us? Well, it means that every year and a half, we have doubled capability to answer better questions. And these, these principles apply broadly within IT, not just processor speed, memory cost, storage cost, network bandwidth, you name it, it's all exponential. Whether it's cost, it's decreasing per unit on an exponential rate. If it's capability, it's increasing at an exponential rate. So what does that mean? It means we have better tools every few years to compete with. It means we can answer questions we wouldn't even thought of answering 15 years ago. First polling question, how often do you do your core technology refreshes? Right? How often are you upgrading to use that advanced weaponry, the new tools that are available? So let's see what we've got. Uh, somebody kind of did an interesting mathematical thing. Every five years or less would include four years and three years, right? But <laughs> not sure about that question. Okay. So, yeah, so, and typically this is true. It's between three and five years, typically, some longer. Uh, but when you think about it, let's take a step back and think, you know, I've been in the industry a while, most of you have been in the industry a while. What does that really mean? Well, let's not forget where we started. Until really the last 10 years or so, every question we have answered, every productivity improvement we've used computers for 
It was answering questions we already answered manually. I put a slide rule in there. This is a Gilson slide rule, by the way. I'm an old fan because I used to live near the factory that produced those. It had plants growing in it when I grew up next to it. Um, the reality is we could answer, you know, if you wanted supply, you know, you don't think GM or GE knew their supply chain in 1950, knew how to manage their distribution. How did they do that? They did it with a database known as a filing cabinet and with computers known as slide rules and the people who operated the slide rules. So most of IT history, until very recently, we've not really asked a lot of new questions, right? We've said, how can we get better, faster, stronger at sales? How can we do it better in this region, that region? We've done all the things that, frankly, were done really go going back over a half century. We've made it more productive, right? We've improved the performance of that. We've done it faster, and that's great. But the acceleration continues. That exponential acceleration rate isn't going away. And now we get to do things where we were crawling, now we're running, and we're beginning to fly. Now we can answer questions that we wouldn't have even thought of a few years ago. So for instance, here you see this you know, funky network diagram. What this is is an index of all human knowledge. It was built using deep learning, a very recent algorithm, and it was done using dimensional pruning, another machine learning algorithm that's very sophisticated that we did not have the processing power to execute on any substantial amount of data five years ago. So how does this change the different segments? If you look at entertainment, I know some of you recognize the Pong screen out there. I grew up with Pong, right? That was our game, right? How can we turn the entertainment experience, you heard Alan talk about this, into a more immersive experience, a more engaging experience? What does it mean to be able to do that? How can we monetize those engaging experiences more thoroughly? On the bottom, you see a, new, you know, a more recent game. And by the way, try finding any game images without copyright restrictions. It's really fun. Uh, and this one is a Shadowfall, it's Killzone. Um, the games now, when my kids are playing them, are so advanced, I don't even recognize that it's a game. It looks like a movie to me. It's pretty amazing. Marketing. Marketing has yielded some of the biggest responses and biggest results with the emergence of these new technologies. Um, here we have a word cloud, and this one I don't have to copyright because I actually created it. Um, in this, what we did was uh, we were brought in to consult for a search engine, second tier search engine, and analyze their click stream. Now, I went in and you pull about four billion rows of data, right? All web query logs. What's the question they were trying to answer? They were saying, hey, you know what? We know, we know we have traffic that's underserved. Search engine business, what are you selling? Selling clicks, right? How do you get people to click more? How do you get them to click in the right area code, in the right, you know, for the right product, in the right vertical? How do you get advertisers to fulfill that? So this started off, actually, interestingly enough, as a sales effort. What they wanted to know is, tell our sales team which advertisers to sign up so we can sell more clicks to them. You can see pretty clearly insurance, credit, debt, health. They had a pretty good sales list at that point. They knew who to go out and sell and get advertisers so they could fulfill the traffic and get more clicks, get more introductions to the advertisers who want those introductions for real traffic. And of course, this goes across all marketing. You see it every day. How do you engage with customers more thoroughly in a socially connected world? How do you mine that data? How do you make better mar you know, marketing recommendations? How do, you, you know, how do you know which books someone should buy or would probably buy if they were presented with the right offer? How do you optimize those offers? How do you do cross-channel attribution? How do you, you know, we've heard some broadcast stories. How do you do attribution from broadcast networks to internet experience, to you know, online media. 
how do you combine all of that and say, what was the whole user experience? What was our real cost to get this user to buy our product? Because the real cost isn't the cost of a broadcast ad. It's the cost of the broadcast ads. It's the cost of the online ads. It's the cost of everything that led up to those final transactions. Healthcare. This was really interesting because last year in Hadoop World in New York, uh, Kaiser had a, a substantial representation there. And they are doubling down in the direction of Internet of Things. So one of their open statements was, we don't know what health looks like. We see you, you know, our doctors see you twice a year, once a year. Only when you're sick, typically. We have no idea what good health looks like. But you know what? Maybe if we had information from your apps on your phone, if we had information, you know, those of you who are cyclists, Strava, if we had information from your scale at home that may be wireless and may be able to upload data to the internet, if we knew more of that information, we would actually be able to figure out how healthy you are and where things might go awry and prevent them rather than always reacting after the fact. Pretty interesting, right? This is what they're spending their money on. I did this, uh, th this is actually an interesting, it's obesity versus longevity in industrialized nations. And, you know, once again, not to be a nationalist, but USA is always on top. <laughs> okay. Cybersecurity. This is something interesting. I talked to Simon about this quite a bit. And the other interesting thing that you run into is most of the methods we've had, you know, if you look at signature-based methods, you know, all, all the heuristic-based methods for malware detection for the last 20 years, they've been out there for a while, and they all stink. Okay, they're all tremendously ineffective. Uh, and the reality is what we're finding now is there are some really promising machine learning algorithms that can find and detect malware, zero-day exploits, real time, and they can do it with 90 plus percent efficiency. Show me, the, you know, show me the security company that's working on that. Well, there are several, and we can talk about that a little bit more. And by the way, unsupervised learning is showing even more promise in this area. Manufacturing. This is an interesting one as well. Because we've all seen the convergence of 3D printing. We've heard about nanotechnology and, and computational material science. Or maybe you haven't heard about it. I'll tell you a little bit about it. Um, the reality is our ability to fabricate on a custom basis is increasing exponentially. It has become an information technology. And it's useful for things like prototyping turbines. I hope it's also useful for the you know, printed shoes below because I have three daughters and I'd like to avoid trips to Nordstrom's whenever possible. Um, and when you think about this, we have to think about what it means to live in a completely custom, a bespoke world where you can print or manufacture whatever you need at the time of need. This is one near and dear to my heart because I don't see a lot of IT ops people using some of these methods to help them improve their operations. So on the top, you see me, I, I actually performed a K-means cluster on a VMware cluster to determine, you see this one little guy that's the outlier on the right there? That's latency versus throughput. So in a cluster, there's one problem there, right? Brought into troubleshoot, it took about five minutes of looking at their detailed data to find this. If you were to parse through using normal time-based technologies, it would have taken much longer, right? And if you look down at the bottom, this is something, an interesting slide. Uh, so this was something I experienced. When people roll out automation, sometimes it's not as clean as we might like, or it, it wasn't as thoroughly planned as we might like. So I came in and actually helped the company look at why they were having performance problems around their automation deployment. And it's largely because they automated all of their backups concurrently as well. So you see that CPU spike? The, all the blue lines on the bottom are five different clusters. You roll them all together, they were all automated to perform their VMware snapshots. 
and take their backups at exactly the same time. How long would it take you to do that, looking at different clusters, looking at the automation framework, how it was configured? A lot longer. We have these tools now in IT operations. We can do very sophisticated analytics. So in short, the ability to ask and answer interesting questions, monetizable questions, it's one of the biggest business differentiators we know of. And of course, a business with many small advantages, many small edges, is really a chainsaw. It can cut its competitors pretty quickly, okay? All of these advantages, all these interesting questions lead to revenue. They lead to money that can be reinvested, compound. We heard Rob talk about that yesterday. And what happens is then it's incremental improvement and it's exponential as well. So how do you get there? We're only going to talk about a few of the methods and a few of the obstacles you'll run into. We'll talk about software development methodologies. We'll talk a little bit about process engineering. We'll talk about automation. And we'll talk about something that's a, a bit of a dicey question, which is culture. Methodologies. So we most, we, we most of us know this, right? I mean, if, if you've used waterfall, you know that it impedes innovation. You can't use waterfall software development methodologies and adapt quickly enough to a changing marketplace. This is common knowledge now, but it's not surprising that there are certain times where you, you don't necessarily want to get rid of that, right? So where does waterfall fit? There are IT projects that are not really IT projects, that are construction projects, and that's where waterfall really came from. Anyone here ever moved a data center? All of you have. Come on. We all know that. You moved a data center. That's a construction project, by the way. That's not an IT project, OK? When you're, when you're breaking out wrenches and moving around massive amounts of equipment, that's a construction project. Um, the other thing is I want to talk a little bit about bimodal IT because I think Alan probably touched on this. For legacy applications, generally, you're not going to need the same kind of rapid pace of innovation. And Gartner came up with this concept called bimodal IT. It's actually quite a good one where they said, yes, all these new agile methodologies are great. They help us drive innovation very quickly. But what they don't do is they don't recognize the fact that some applications just don't need that innovation. You have SAP. Are you really going to do Scrum on an SAP deployment? The answer is probably not. It's not called for. Uh, and a lot of legacy applications are that way. If you transition to bimodal IT or to doing agile methodologies across the board, it takes time. And we like to talk about the technologies, you know, oh, let's talk about Scrum, let's talk about your development framework, continuous integration, this, test-driven development, all of that. The reality is the thing that takes time has more to do with management, in my experience, than it has to do with the technologies or the skill sets. I've been an executive. A lot of people in the room are IT executives. We love our Gantt charts, right? Adapting from a Gantt chart mentality and a waterfall mentality takes time. It takes time to know how to manage the business risk better, how to manage sequencing and staffing and all the things that you have to work around. And these are things you have to keep in mind when you're transitioning. So if done right, it does take time. It takes planning. It takes gradual, you know, a game of chess to move the pieces into the right place so you can transition successfully. Otherwise, you risk a flame out, where yes, everybody gets enthusiastic, it becomes the fat of the day, and then in six months you're back to doing waterfall because it face planted. These methodologies impact culture, uh, and vice versa. We're going to talk a little bit about culture. You may also find in IT, and this has been my experience, that some people are more suitable for agile environments. They like that kind of dynamic interaction. 
they're less process-oriented people generally, or they're more, I should say, faster process-oriented people. They're, they're less controls-based oriented people. Um, so you might find your staff bifurcate as well along the lines of who's really helping to drive the innovation and who is really more interested in maintaining the legacy systems or maintaining the core systems that don't require the rapid pace of innovation. It's neither good nor bad, right? I mean, it's like saying, you know, you've got a cop. You don't want cops to be early adopters of any new technology. You don't want cops to necessarily be uh, out on a limb every other day. Uh, and a lot of legacy applications require that kind of policing, that kind of mentality where they're protected very carefully. Process we're going to talk about in some more detail because this is the most buzzword-laden area of IT right now. And I want to get away for a little bit from the buzzwords and talk a little bit more about the practical nature of it. And I've got an example here where just a few phases of incremental improvements, you can yield dramatic results in reducing your time to market for new ideas. You've heard DevOps, everyone talks about DevOps. And you know, to tell an interesting story, I know some guys, one person in particular who uh, I've worked with for many years, who put on his LinkedIn, you know, I was doing DevOps before there was DevOps. And it's kind of an interesting statement. So you ask the usual questions. So were your engineers doing test-driven development? No. Were they doing Agile? Were they doing Scrum? Uh, well, kind of, they were doing a hybrid. No, that's fine, they were doing a hybrid. Were you doing automatic, you know, you're doing continuous integration? Were you doing any kind of automated release process? No, no, and no. What it really was, was we had a lot of meetings and sometimes drank beer between the engineers and the operations people. Okay, well, that's, that's a step along the path. I don't want to denigrate it, but it's not DevOps. What I would say on all these things is, you know, do research, you can look at these things. Approach it from the perspective of trying to yield the best results most, most quickly and most simply. Iterate on any kind of process you're engineering you're doing and be open and you know, be transparent about why you're doing it and what you're doing. We've talked about this. DevOps is a path. It's an iterative process unto itself. Many, many, many different component technologies to it. The reality is it impacts every part of the way you will do business. I mean, mo some of you have read the Gene Kim book, The Phoenix Project. Um, one of the interesting things in that book that I always took issue with uh, was, you know, his protagonist, you know, made an enemy of the product person, like, in the first third of the book. And uh, one of the things I don't like, I'm married to a product person, so that doesn't work for me. Um, and it would yield bad results in my household. Um, so the reality is you always have to kind of balance things out. You can't just say, you know, this is our religious dogma. We're going we're gonna to pursue this. You have to incrementally approach it, yield incre you know, gradual results, and the results will build on themselves. Do not engage in any of the product Tourette's that technologists we love to do and talk about you know, specific point technologies that you want to deploy or you think will be useful along the way. Um, generally, those aren't useful until you get critical mass in your DevOps migration. So you know, the biggest process improvements are sometimes the most obvious things. And by the way, how many people in the room, just raise of hands, I'm not, this is not a survey question, have done value stream mapping for their, for their value stream? How many have mapped it out? So that's the starting point. That's step number one in DevOps. You can't optimize what you don't yet know and have not yet me measured, right? And that's something to keep in mind as you think about how you're going to accelerate, how you're going to accommodate these exponential demands on resources, on productivity, and on growth. This is a good one. So have you deployed infrastructure as a service automation? I don't, I'm not going to talk about different products here. You know some of them. You realize, you know, if you're doing OpenStack, 
if you're, if you're using EC2, how many of you have deployed them? Okay. We'll give it a few more moments. So, more no's than yeses. So when we talk about automation, ah, what automation tools do you use? And these are config few configuration management, homegrown, AWS. So the, those of you who did answer yes, what do you think? Yeah. Who was it, Rob? Somebody, somebody actually laughed at me when I said homegrown on the automation tool. I'll have you know. So, yeah, homegrown is typically how things begin, by the way, um, and it's important. So, Kanban is a different methodology than DevOps. It actually, parts of these overlap. Kanban is basically everything, like in all process engineering, it still begins with the value stream map, right? You still have to understand how you do what you do and how long it takes, what the key metrics are within that. Um, Kanban actually is usually used as a hybrid method, and it's where people take a understanding of what their capacities are in certain parts of their value stream. Like say, you have systems administrators, you have, you, know, you have a convergent infrastructure management team, and what you want to do is you want to figure out what they can actually handle throughput-wise, work-wise at any given time. Um, most often, it's combined with a uh, Scrum or some other agile software development methodology uh, if it's hybridized at all. And it can yield very solid results. So those of you who've read you know, a lot of DevOps books, a lot of guidelines, and say, you know what, this sounds pretty intense and pretty intimidating, uh, maybe we need to start letting the air out of the tires a little bit and see if we can get something a little more modest going. Kanban's a good place to start because it gets you out of the reactive mode of saying we are always swamped with what we're doing. It allows you to limit the work in progress. This is another one. This is one of my favorites because we don't talk about it much. We don't talk about Six Sigma much. We don't talk about Lean much in the IT industry. But the reality is all the tools that you use for those other two methodologies, for DevOps and Kanban, all the statistical tools, all the analytical tools, value stream mapping itself, it's a, all of those are Lean Six Sigma methodologies. If you're a small business and you already have a Lean or Six Sigma process engineering framework, think about applying it to your IT. Why is that beneficial? Why would you do that versus DevOps or Kanban? Well, first of all, if you already have the practice, it's already part of your culture. You are, your, your executive team already gets it. You can yield good results with it. You don't need to get into you know, the specifics of IT technology to know that. You can optimize any process with these. You just have to be flexible about how you approach it. Okay, I think this is our final polling question. What, at least for this talk, what forms of process engineering or IT optimization have you considered or do you use? Okay. So good mix. That's interesting. Now this is something that I actually talk about a bit and uh, get into some very interesting conversations with people. Automation. Um, too many shops have an addiction and I've run them. A lot of us have run them. Some of us may still be running them. Uh, to GUIs. And when people say, oh, we're, you know, we're really focused on automation, and I say, okay, what source code repository do you use for your automation scripts? You use Git, Subversion, what do you use? And the answer is, oh, well, we keep them on a hard drive somewhere. You know, okay, well, 
we need to talk about that. We need to help you out with that because that's not the way to go with this. People use GUIs, get addicted to GUIs. GUIs are good in IT for one thing, visualization of data, right? They are horrible, horrible management tools. And they're horrible management tools because they're not reproducible. What manager, sysadmin, storage admin, network engineer A does through his GUI to get something done may be dramatically different than what storage engineer or sysadmin B does. And the outcomes, therefore, are not reproducible. You can't improve what you can't reproduce. And therefore, stay away from them. Trust me, they're dangerous. It's like Tijuana when you're 19. Stay away from there. OK. Get ready for virtualization version two. You heard Rob talk about it a bit yesterday. Containers, microvisors, all of the new technologies. So everybody in, the, everybody in this room was in IT when virtualization hit its full, full stride, right? What did that do to our management complexity? Well, it increased it an order of magnitude, right? For every bare metal server you used to manage, now you have 10 VMs. How much management overhead is there in 10 VMs? Well, 10 times the, the bare metal, right? We'll get ready for 100 containers per bare metal server or more. And what does that mean? Well, it means we better be good at automation or you're going to be swamped the way the first few generations uh, or the first few years of operating in virtualized environments were. They popped up everywhere like rabbits and they got away from us a little bit and then we reeled it back in. Be ready for it. Finally, culture. Culture is something we don't talk about very much, but it's absolutely crucial to everything we do. At Rate 8, we, we have a very human approach to IT. That's, that's part of our ethos. And one of the things you have to keep in mind is, and I, I'm certainly not going to do a survey question about which organization you think you work in, whether it's pathological or generative. Um, let's just say openly, the data are in. If you work in a generative, environment, where there's transparency and trust, all the benefits of you know, constructive response to failure, knowing how to fail quickly as a team and how to recover, all of that yields better financial results for your company. That's a fact. The data is pretty conclusive in that. Don't believe me, believe Jez Humble and the people who put out the DevOps report. Uh, do some research. It's everywhere. That's a known thing. You work in a, you know, every step left you take on that chart, whether it's bureaucratic or pathological, and some may be a mix of both, uh, it's going to impact your performance, and it can impact it disproportionately. So we're back here. What I did now was I said, OK, let's look at that GDP. It's growing at an exponential rate. And where's it going to be in 10 years? In the next 10 years, we're going to add more GDP per capita than we added between 1820 and 1940. Are you ready for that level of efficiency? Are you ready for that level of productivity? Are you thinking about what that means, given the complexity of what we're looking at with respect to Moore's Law and all the computational abilities will have, all the interesting questions your business stakeholders are going to ask. Are we ready for that? Because it's our choice. We can either be the chainsaw or we can be the tree, right? If you're not getting part, your portion or more of that exponential growth in GDP, you're not helping your company compete at that level, you're the tree. Okay, and that's it. Thank you. Sean Collins. All right, Sean, excellent. I think the Tijuana reference hit a lot of people there. All right, so uh, let's get some questions in for Sean real quick. We'll get a couple questions in. Uh, there's got to be some questions for Sean. Let me see if I'm missing somebody while I'm looking around here. There's one. 
Oh, Alan. I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> He's waving up and down. I couldn't see you back there. Sorry, sir. I... You bring up an interesting point about collecting data. So you were talking about healthcare, and you know we can collect data right from a scale or from a device and mash it up and make some conclusions. So it, it begs the question of can we and should we? So we have a similar problem that we can collect enormous amounts of data about behaviors and people, people's con, consumption habits. Sometimes folks get very uncomfortable that we can get this data and even worse, that we're collecting it un unbeknownst to them, whether they should or should not know is a, is a whole different thing. But what do you see the limits forming where you can collect data, you might have collected data, but maybe we shouldn't be using that data? Yeah, this is a very good question. I, and to give a really good example of this, for instance, I ran analytics and IT and business process engineering at Lower My Bills, and we sold the company to Experian, uh, to Experian Interactive Marketing uh, back in the mid-2000s. And one of the things we found that as we were part of the bigger Experian corporate entity was we had access to a huge amount of data. Now, Lower My Bills did lending lead generation. What we found as part of Experian is if you logged into, if you actually hit our site, you do geolocation on your IP, you enter in your last name, 95% of the time we knew your last name and your location, we knew exactly who you were. When we offered to pre-populate the form with everything, including your credit score, we had an abandon rate that was astonishingly high. Um, why? Because it gets creepy to people, right? It gets really creepy and it scares them. Um, so what I would say, so there are two things I would say, and I'm probably going to freak out some of the people in the room. I've been in ad tech most of my life. So what I would say is we don't want to use information that consumers would react negatively to if they found out about it, right? However, we are going to use information that generally they're not going to know about. And that's part of life. I mean, that's part of the modern world we live in. I'm going to quote the head of the NSA. There are no more secrets. There are only secret half-lives, right? There's only, there's only a time frame between when you thought Ashley Madison was secure <laughs> and it's not anymore. Or when you thought, you know, uh, your path driving to work was secure and it's not anymore. Um, so what I would say is, this is an evolving space. And what we found over time is consumer uh, acceptance of what we're collecting and what we're leveraging has, has I should say, improved. It's increased. So people now are far more com comfortable with saying, hey, give me your location information. Or give me your, you know, it, let, us, uh, let us connect your Facebook to this other app or this or that. So I, I would say, Right now, you have to be careful and test how consumers are going to respond to that kind of pervasive information. Um, but you, you can't shy away from it because what's, what's now, what may today cause consumers to overreact in five years will be probably perfectly acceptable because that's just the arc of how data and, and that information is evolving. That's what I would say. Great. Any other questions for Sean? Look around. Is anybody in the back I'm missing? Hopefully I didn't freak you all out about that half-life of secrets. I really don't know anything <laughs> yeah. more than Is there anything else you'd like to add, Sean? No. No. All right. Well, you guys been wondering. Give Sean Collins a great big hand. All right. <laughs>